Love, the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel, Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. great to have you with us as together we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. This broadcast is reaching across the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. If you would like to partner with us to take the whole book to the whole world, please consider making a donation. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab your Bible and let's dig in. Well, good day to you. My name is Sean and I'm the pastor here at Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. I'm so glad that you are here with us. You might be fellowshipping with us through broadcast, but we consider you an important member of our Calvary Chapel Birmingham family. So it's good to have you with us. While you're here, do me a favor, and if you haven't already, click subscribe and ring that bell so that you are notified whenever a new video is posted. Also, if you could share this video with your friends and family, that would help us to put faithful Bible teaching into the hands of even more people. I know that many of you give when you are able to attend church, but please continue to give to the church even when you are unable to be here in person with us. Being a small church, giving tends to be small in amount and, well, sparse. But if you don't give, we can't afford rent, we can't afford utilities, and we will be unable to broadcast as we do. Without being here at the church, there are several ways you can give. You can give by mail, either set up an automatic uh, contributions through your bank or perhaps a bill pay service, or you can mail it directly here. Our address is Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, 1738 Morgan Park Road, Pelham, Alabama, 35124. Checks can be made out to Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Or you can give online at www.calvarybirmingham.com. In the menu at the top of the page, just click on giving and it will take you to a page where you can give a one-time gift or you can commit to a scheduled gift. Please pray about giving into this ministry so we can continue to faithfully teach God's Word as we have always done. All right, so before we uh, continue our study of Matthew and um, draw ever closer to the moment of Jesus' crucifixion, let's take a couple of minutes here this morning to reflect on, well, just how privileged we are. 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, says, Of the salvation... The prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you, through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. The patriarchs, the prophets, the, the multitudes, they only had an inkling of the revelation that we have received. And yet, Many of them took God at His Word and believed. Now today we have the fullness of God's Word available to us in our hands, on our bookshelves, 
sometimes in two, three, four, five, six different translations. And they detail the prophecies and the fulfillment of the prophecies. And we get to study it. So we are incredibly privileged that we do, in fact, get to gather here together, worship the Lord in song, participate in communion together, and open up our Bibles and study His Word. In the previous chapter, Jesus had entered into Jerusalem and He had entered upon a donkey's colt to the shouts of the multitudes calling Him Son of David and asking by way of psalm for Him to save now. Of course, the people were not thinking of spiritual salvation. They were thinking of physical salvation from their Roman oppressors. But Jesus was there this time around our spiritual salvation. Jesus went to the temple. He kicked out the the leaven of the priests, the money changing and and the, the animal exchanging scammers. He cleansed and He healed the blind and the lame. The next day, Jesus was teaching in the temple courtyards and was confronted by the chief priests and by the elders of the people and the Pharisees. And they demanded to know by what authority, or in other words, by what name, did He do these things. And Jesus immediately pointed out their lack of belief in God. They wouldn't have believed Him if He had told them. But he continued to speak to the religious authorities and he continued in parables. And each of the parables pointed out their unbelief and and their being in this state of, of judgment and condemnation. Those whom they saw as sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, well, in fact, just the everyday Joe. These were the people who were believing in Jesus and they were entering into eternal life. And each of those parables that Jesus told was like this, a warning to the unbelieving and a a condemnation of those who were persistent and unbelieving. And this was followed by even more questioning from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Even the lawyers and the Herodians then got involved. But Jesus, without without great effort, defeated their arguments. He pointed out their ignorance of the Scriptures and their lack of, again, belief. And then chapter 22 ended with Jesus taking things back to what the crowds were calling Him when He entered Jerusalem. That is, Son of David. He asked the Pharisees, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is He? And they said, He is the Son of David. The most common title of the Messiah was Son of David. As we noted last week, it was a reference to the prophecy of the seed of David from from, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Behind the people's use of that title, Son of David, was the expectation that that there would one day come this this great prince who would be of the line of David. And, and, and it went further to say that the Savior would destroy Israel's enemies and lead the people in conquest, in, in world prominence. And when the people, including the religious leaders of Israel, thought of the Messiah, it was in terms of nationalism, political and, and military power, and, and glory for the, for the nation. It was not in terms of suffering and sacrifice, Restor- restoration, redemption. The Pharisees considered Psalm 110 to be a messianic text, and, and Jesus asked them about that text, saying, If the Christ is the Son of David... How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies till I, till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, 
How is he his son? David, the author of, uh, of that particular psalm, calls God Lord, but also calls the Messiah Lord. But David wrote under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And, and the psalm pictures God calling Messiah to sit at his right hand, the place of honor and power. And clearly David was saying that the Messiah is Lord, and Jesus is saying that he is Lord. And the true description of him is Son of God. As the Son of God, as the Son of David, Jesus is fully human. As the Son of God, Jesus is fully God. Jesus had been called Son of David by the multitudes. And as the Son of David, Jesus was the divine Son of God. In other words, standing before them was David's Lord, the fulfillment of prophecy, the Messiah, which they had long been waiting for. But he was not here as the conquering king Messiah. He was here to die as the perfect Passover sacrifice. But instead of belief, they persisted in their unbelief. And the text ended that they would no longer dare question him. And so today we find Jesus speaking to his disciples and to the people, the multitudes, pronouncing a series of woes upon the religious leadership and warning the people not to continue with the Pharisees in their unbelief. Now, I want to bring your attention to something real quick. The, the religious authorities of Israel, they were in no way wrong for questioning Jesus or in seeking answers from him. Their problem was their persistent unbelief despite the answers that were given and the evidence that was presented. In fact, no matter what answer they received and no matter the evidence that was put before them, they would only refuse to believe. But this should not be taken to mean that we cannot bring questions to the Lord. Having questions for God does not mean lack of belief. God is okay with a two-way conversation. He's not offended by questions. Look in the Psalms. And you will find that the Psalms speak rather bluntly. A good passage to consider would be Psalm 58. A psalm of compassion. <laughs> Where David writes, Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them flow away as waters which run continually. When he bends his bow, let his arrows be as if cut in pieces. Let them be like a snail which melts away as it goes, like a stillborn child of a woman that they may not see the sun. So David writing, obviously in compassion for his enemies. In Psalm 13, verses 1-2, through two, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Has anybody prayed a prayer like that? How long will you hide your face from me? Where are you, God? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? Why is this happening to me? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? You know, sometimes when I read the Psalms, I, I am surprised by the, the, the bluntness. I almost asked myself, how dare they even... How could they even say that to God? I mean, it, it even... Sometimes I, I, I'm reading, I'm like, that is so crass. That is like really daring. But the fact is that they were being honest with God. 
They were being open about how they feel. They were presenting their feelings to God, even sometimes expressing hatred and and anger and very little mercy toward others. And this is the challenge. This is the challenge for me, and and it's probably a challenge for you too. God is our heavenly Father. He doesn't want dishonest communication. When we come to God as if all is okay and we are okay and the world is okay and just whatever happens, that's good with us. What is that? Do we dare go to God with lies? Because that is certainly not honest. What those of you that, that have kids? What if, what if, what if your your child came to you one morning and said, "Oh, father, in the kitchen, thou art a great father." <laughs> uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> I have I've yet to hear that. Maybe I will this afternoon. I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, if if you were if you were if you heard that from your child, you would think something's wrong. Something is up. They are covering for something. They're trying to manipulate me somehow. God knows what's going on. He knows He knows what you're thinking. He knows what your needs are. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you want to happen. So, (laughs) we're not fooling Him. But I think sometimes we approach God in prayer as if we can fool Him. But the reality is is that prayer is actually aligning ourselves with God's will. It's not the other way around. It's not manipulating God to align Him with our will. If we think that, then we're just fooling ourselves. So like the psalmist, we can be very honest when we go to God in prayer. Hebrews 4, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can approach the throne and we can do so boldly and honestly. So let's be careful not to think that that the Pharisees here and the other religious leaders that came to Jesus with questions, that, that, that Jesus saw that as a problem. The problem was their refusal to accept the truth. And while we're thinking about this, let's also remember that Jesus taught, as in Luke 6, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. When you love your enemies, they cease to be your enemies in your own eyes. But instead, they become people who desperately need the gospel of grace. The religious leaders were not the enemies of Jesus. Jesus was the enemy of the religious leaders because that was their designation for Him. That was what they made Him. They made Him their enemy. Why did they do that? Why was he their enemy? Because he did not meet the criteria of their opinion for who the Messiah should have been. Because they have been lied to by the devil. And they preferred to believe the devil's lies than believing Jesus. And this is why Jesus said of them in John 8, you are the father of the, 
you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. They were unable to, to truly hear Jesus because they were listening to the devil and they were believing his lies. They embraced falsehood over the truth. Today there are many who, can, who either consider Jesus an enemy or, or choose to believe something erroneous because the truth threatens their opinions or their traditions. My Jesus isn't like that. I don't believe Jesus would have done that. I certainly don't believe Jesus would have said that. Instead, they believe lies and they believe falsehoods because of their preferences, because of their own opinions. And that was the case with those who were opposing Jesus here. It, it may not be shocking to us, but it is quite sad to read in verse 46 of the previous chapter, from that day on, they did not dare question him anymore. And it's sad because if they had, perhaps they would have eventually believed. Nevertheless, Jesus didn't give up on them. He didn't walk away from them. They walked away from Jesus. Now, I've mentioned before that chapter and verse references are not original to the text. They were added later on for our ease of being able to look up things. Unfortunately, sometimes those chapter divisions come in very awkward places and they disrupt the, uh, the action or the flow of the text. And the action here in verse 23 is continuous from where we were when we ended in chapter 22. So keep that in mind as we continue to study on through the text. First, let's, let's ourselves go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning, this brand new morning that you have created for us. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for who we are in you, Lord. You caused us to awaken this morning, the very beating of our hearts, everything in our lives is dependent on you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. As we study your word this morning, Lord, we ask that you would open up our hearts to receive from you all that you have to teach us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, let's actually go back a little bit. Let's start with verse 46 of the previous chapter. And move into chapter 23. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare question him any more. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. I want to stop here for a second and just deal with that statement. They sit in Moses' seat. Um, the Greek word is cathedra. It, it, it means chair, it means seat. It, it's a word that's found in only a few other places in Scripture. And where it's found there, it's just a generic seat. Now, in an extra biblical text called the, the Shepherd of Hermos, um, there is a reference to a cathedra that is made of snow white wool. And there is also a reference to a false prophet sitting in the cathedra while the faithful sat instead on a bench. Now, Jewish commentary on the Old Testament, the, that is the, the Midrash, uh, says that a, a seat was made for Moses that made one sit and yet seem to be standing at the same time. Archaeological evidence from the first century seems to contradict those reports, either that or, or perhaps the, the, child or the, the, the style over the years changed somewhat. Um, because snow white wool sounds 
to be much more comfortable than gritty hard stone. But nonetheless, examples of these seats from, from Jesus' time indicate that these were stone seats in the synagogues, though yes, they were slightly elevated. Now, Midrash also says that Moses' seat eventually became the particular, the particular place in the synagogue where the leaders used to sit, symbolizing the succession of teachers of Torah down through the ages. So, the seat of Moses was an honored place. It was an honored chair that was often found in synagogues. The seat was on a raised platform. It was occupied by men who claimed the exalted position of teaching by the authority of Moses. So God gave the law to Moses. Moses handed it down to Joshua. The law was entrusted to, from Joshua to elders. And then there were the prophets. And eventually it was the scribes and the Pharisees, etc., etc., so it was these religious authorities to whom the people looked for their understanding of the law and thus their understanding of God. But remember that the, the scribes and the Pharisees also held to the traditions of the elders. That is the oral law that was not from God. And as we noted earlier in this gospel, the oral law placed a man-made burden on the people which God did not intend. The religious leaders of Israel, they were not faithful to their position, and they were, as Jesus stated, and as they themselves even recognized, hypocritical in regards to many things. Jesus has now turned to his disciples in the text here, and to the multitudes, and he is going to pronounce several woes upon the Pharisees. But first, he's going to point out the error of the Pharisees. So, verse 3 continues, I know I read this, but we'll reread it. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do not, and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers." But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best feasts, the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Ravi, Ravi. But you do not be called Ravi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all Brethren, let's stop there for a second. So you can almost picture in your mind the Pharisees as they hear Jesus now turning to the multitudes and speaking. He had been addressing them. Now he has turned to his disciples and turned to his multitudes and is speaking to them. And at first it sounds as if he is in fact commending them. The scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that is observe and do. But their countenance most likely sunk quite a bit when Jesus continued, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. So Jesus is by no means commending them. And, and we must also understand that these are not instructions for us today. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples and his multitudes. And so Jesus says to them, to the point that the scribes and the Pharisees have taught you the principles of the law of Moses, obey them. Now, of course, as we studied last week, Jesus responded to a scribe. And that scribe was not far from believing in Jesus. And he had asked Jesus, which is the great commandment in the law? The idea of the question was, which of the commandments does a person need to keep in order to be saved? And this was a debate that had been going on among the Ravis for a very long time. And of course, we know from James, the brother of Jesus, that breaking one part of the law is to be guilty of the whole law. In other words, being innocent of breaking one law does not excuse the breaking of another law. 
Jesus had responded by reinforcing the law. He boiled the law down into two, two summary commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law is an elaboration of those two summary commandments. But Jesus' point was that even with all the law summarized into these two things, no one can keep it. But Jesus did. He fulfilled and He satisfied the requirements of the prophets. And it is in Him that we are made righteous in the sight of God. And Jesus told the scribe that He was not far from the kingdom of heaven. He told this man that because the law had in a very, in a very literal way, the law had brought him to Jesus. And we have this same idea here in chapter 23 of Matthew. The religious leaders, they knew the law very well, but they are not able to keep the law. Not only do they break the law themselves, but they shift blame off of themselves by adding to the law and putting unnecessary burdens on other people. They added in traditions that made it a thing of thousands upon thousands of rules and regulations. In other words, it became an intolerable burden. But here they are now, and they are in the presence of the Son of God who has been tested by these same Pharisees and time after time found to be, he has been found to be without blemish, without spot. So he is correcting the religious leaders and he is warning the people and his disciples about them. And he is pointing out that the people need a Savior. Now, I'm not saying that believing in Christ, we do not need to have reverence for God or respect for others. I'm not saying that we can set aside those two principles. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbors yourself. But believing in Jesus, even though we fail, we are not condemned of failing those things. We may lose rewards when works are judged, but we are never by any means under condemnation. But believing Jesus, we have entered into eternal life. Now look to verses 5-7. through seven. Here's where the religious leaders miss the boat. Again, those two things. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. They put on a love for God while they, in fact, love themselves more. And their love of others was self-serving. The religious leaders would, would loudly announce the good works they were doing so that they would be esteemed in the eyes of others. There was this thing that the Pharisees would do. When they were going to give to the poor and, and to the needy, they would go out to a street corner and they would blow a horn under the guise of calling all the needy to themselves. But the fact was, they wanted everyone to know what they were doing. They wanted to draw attention to themselves and to their good works. The word for hypocrite, which we'll see here, originally comes from a Greek word that means actor. Acting as if you're doing something for one reason when the reality is you're doing it for an entirely different reason. Doing something because you love people or because you love the praise of people. The clinical sounding word phylactery. <laughs> It sounds like something you, you don't want to go to the doctor and hear them say you have yeah. or you need. You need a phylactery. I'm going to come in Tuesday. The, the Hebrew equivalent is tefillin. 
Um, now, Tefillin, they are these, those leather boxes. You've probably seen them. They have the long leather straps, and they're, they're worn during prayers. Uh, 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 Orthodox Jews will be wearing these things. They're worn on the forehead and on the uh, left arm. They were to remind the Israelites that everything that they thought or did was to be in accordance with the law. Now, Zitzi, those were the long knotted strings that were worn on the, the corners of their garments and on the uh, talit or the, the prayer shawls. And they were intended to remind uh, the Israelites to obey God's laws. So observant Jews would wear these as a way to obey the commandment of Deuteronomy 6. Also found, uh, the commandments also found in other places in the Torah. Um, it's a very literal interpretation of the instruction to hold the law dear. So these phylacteries, they, are, they were little leather boxes. One was strapped to the wrist, one to the forehead. The one on the wrist is a, a, is a, a box with, that just has one compartment on it. And, and, and inside that compartment, there's a, a piece of parchment with four scriptures. Uh, those scriptures were, were Exodus 13, 1 through 10, and 11 through 16, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and 11, 13 through 21. Um, the, the one that was worn on the forehead, is it was exactly the same except for it had four separate compartments, um, one for each of those scriptures. Now, the religious leaders would make these larger and larger so that they were more and more visible and became actually quite absurd. Um, kind of like a, hey, look at me kind of thing. There are even stories of men who made their, their, the Teflon so large that they could barely stand under the weight of them. The tassels, now in the Greek, the Crespidon, um, Hebrew, Zitzit, um, God commanded his people to make fringes on the borders of their garments so that when they looked on them, they might remember the commandments of God. Um, they, the command for these is found in Numbers 15 um, and uh, Deuteronomy 22. Now, these fringes were originally knotted tassels that were worn on the four corners of the, the outer garment. In fact, sometimes you'll see uh, uh, if somebody's maybe a, a, a part of the Hebrew roots movement of Christianity or so forth, they'll wear these knots on, the, you know, on their jeans, on the hoops, going down in four spots. I'm sure you all, you all at some point have probably seen that as well. Um, so today they're, they're, they're more commonly, however, they're seen in a prayer shawl. You, you may see somebody with a prayer shawl, um, somebody involved in, a, again, Hebrew roots or perhaps a Orthodox Jewish individual that's wearing the prayer shawl and it will have those tassels hanging off of them. So the religious leaders of Jesus's time, they would make these tassels larger than, than normal um, so that everyone would know that, hey, you're, you're looking at an extremely, a more so pious guy than, than you are, right? So, wanting that kind of public recognition, they then also sought to occupy the best seats when, when it was uh, time for feasts or perhaps they were at the synagogue. They wanted the seats that communicated that they bore a higher rank, that they had more prominence, um, see, seats that were nearest to the host or seats that faced the synagogue congregation. If they could find a, a raised platform to stand on, that's where they would be. They also loved titles. They liked to be addressed as Ravi, which means teacher. They demanded respect even more so than, than one might respect one's parents because they claimed that they were better than parents because their words gave eternal life. And they wanted to be thought of as the fathers of the faith. Now, the parallel texts in Mark and Luke do not include all that we have here in the Matthew text. But they do let us know that the religious leaders abuse their positions in order to accumulate gain for themselves. We saw them doing this earlier with their money, their money uh, changing and the animal selling schemes that they were doing in the temple grounds. Here, more specific to the scribes, Jesus says they also devour widows' houses. We see that in Mark chapter 12 and also in the parallel text of Luke chapter 20. Now, the scribes, they were experts in the law. They knew it up and down. And because of this, they were often served as trustees for estates. And they would then use their position to siphon money to themselves. 
They would do their good works to promote themselves. They would use their position and the trust that was given to them in order to cheat people. They would seek after titles in order to appear important. They would lord over others. They would steal from widows. And we would all think of that and we'd say, those are terrible things. And certainly there were things that warranted condemnation. But we should note that in the parallel text of Mark 12 and Luke 20, the comma that we find coming after the word scribes is not supposed to be there. And without that comma, it changes the meaning of the text just a little bit. Jesus' comments then would not be about all scribes, but about the scribes who do those things. Now, we know that there were some religious leaders and and community leaders who did, in fact, believe in Jesus. There were also certainly those who didn't believe in Jesus, but yet took their duties and their responsibilities seriously and wouldn't do those things. But the majority were apparently involved in these kind of corrupt practices. Let's read on. Start with verse 8. But you do not be called Ravi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are, you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, who is, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. (coughs) Jesus would have directed this part more so to his disciples than just to the crowds in general. And there's, there's really no way around what Jesus says here. Jesus says, do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, who, he who is in heaven, and do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. Jesus, is, he was not speaking of physical relationship, father, mother, etc. He is speaking of titles. Just as earlier, um, he earlier observed that Pharisees wanted to be called father and teacher because they liked the honor of it. And so Jesus warns his disciples about the hypocrisy of seeking after titles. Specifically, he warns his disciples against using three specific titles. Ravi, Father, and Teacher. Now, what we don't want to do here, and something that that is done quite a bit, in regards to these particular verses, is throwing out the baby with the bathwater. There are people who argue that we shouldn't call anyone by any title. And they especially then hate the use of the word pastor or teacher. It doesn't take very much research into the Bible to find that shepherd, Preacher, teacher, and father are words that are used in the New Testament epistles as titles. For instance, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. And then Ephesians 4, verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And looking in the epistles, we also find that Jesus doesn't mean it's wrong to show honor to those who teach in the church. Paul certainly didn't think so. In 1 Timothy, he wrote, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So in the New Testament, we find shepherd, we find elder, we find deacon, we find teacher, and so on and so on. Many, many times and used in a positive sense. 
Now, that being said, Jesus speaking to his disciples certainly did say, do not. So if Paul and other New Testament authors used those titles positively in their writings, then how do we take this? Well, we have to consider intent then. We can look at the entirety of what Jesus was saying and to whom, and we can very easily understand the intent. The Pharisees, they wanted to to dress and to act in a way that brought attention to themselves. They wanted to be exalted so that they might have influence and power. They wanted to lord over people and gain riches off of those who trusted them. In other words, the teachers of the law and and the Pharisees had patterned their leadership after the example of what we might see as worldly rulers. So like the worldly rulers, their goal, their main goal, was to extend their own power and authority. Essentially, they all posed as little Christs, that is, anointed ones. And this was very much a reason for their own opposition of the true Christ. But Jesus' disciples, they're not to be like that. They are to live their lives in such a way that people are directed to Jesus. That Jesus is glorified. That is, their good deeds should not glorify themselves, but glorify God. Earlier in chapter 20, we saw the disciples concerned about positions of prominence. And there Jesus told them, whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Jesus' disciples are not, well, they were to place servant leadership as being their, their highest priority. Therefore, specific to our text, greatness in the fellowship of Christ is much different from that that was displayed by the religious leadership of Israel. In the fellowship of Christ, it is to be servant leadership. The intent of the text is that God is to be glorified in the life of the believer rather than the believer seeking glory for his or herself. And we find in verse 12 a promise of humility for those who seek. Leave all these things to God. Let Him assign title and position. We need to move on. This next section of verses is the most terrible and sustained indictment that we even find in the New Testament. Jesus directs a series of, of, of woes against the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, the Greek word for woe, which we've, we've actually looked at this word several times before, but it's also a word that you don't want to hear from your doctor. It's a blech. <laughs> That is, I mean, literally, that that is the word. It's one of those words, it kind of sounds like what it means, right? It it, it expresses kind of like a, it's kind of a disgust and an anger at the same time with mixed in with sorrow and pity or or grief. Um, So, yeah, you don't want to hear it from your doctor. Um, And you might even consider it to be, as Jesus is using it here, to be a righteous kind of anger. Um, But probably more so um, the anger that would come out of a broken heart of love. And so what we find in Jesus' words here is this, this brutal indictment that is wrapped up in compassion. Because there is impending tragedy. Now I hinted at it earlier, but this text here, we also find that word hypocrite. Originally the Greek word hypocrites, uh, it meant one who answers. 
it then came to be specially connected with, uh, with stage dialogue. It then came to mean an actor in the worst sense of the term. That is, a pretender. One who puts on an external show while inwardly having thoughts and feelings of an entirely different kind. To Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees were men who were acting a part. So, he pronounces a series of woes against them. And there's about seven of them here. We, we won't make them through all of them this morning. We won't make it all the way through all seven this morning. Um, but let's read on and let's find out what those woes are. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. In the New English translation, it reads a little bit easier, and it's also actually a little bit more literal. In verse 13 there reads, But woe to you experts in the law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites! You keep locking people out of the kingdom of heaven, for you neither enter nor permit those trying to enter to go in. Now, what's interesting is the New English translation does not include verse 14. And neither does the English Standard Version, the ESV, and many of the other more modern translations. And, and there, this is not a diabolical thing. They did not you know, gather together and, and plot and plan to take away this, this one verse or to change Scripture. In fact, the, the reality is they are actually being more honest to the original by not including that verse 14 because the verse doesn't belong here. The better ancient manuscripts do not have that verse 14. And textual analysis uh, indicates that it was something that was added in later on. But why? why? Why would that have been added in later on? Well, the parallel texts in Mark and Luke include that saying. But Mark and Luke, they don't include much of what we find in this part of Matthew. And it may have been that a copyist somewhere down the line included that verse from Mark and Luke thinking that it belonged there. Now, I do like to investigate the parallel text, and I'm glad, <laughs> because we, that allows us to understand these things, and, and we would be investigating it other anyways, so we'd be reading this verse anyways just in the parallel text. So, being faithful to the manuscript evidence, verse 14 is actually excluded in more modern translations. So, verse 13, the, the experts of the law and the Pharisees, they glorified themselves by outward observance. They appeared to be righteous, but in their hearts there was bitterness, and there was envy, and there was pride, and there was arrogance. They put on a, a pretense of pointing others toward righteousness, but they themselves were far from it. Jesus goes on to speaking about what the religious leaders were doing currently. They were trying to keep people from believing Jesus. And they were doing so because they themselves did not believe Jesus. They also used their positions to manipulate and exploit the vulnerable, such as widows. And for this reason, Jesus says that they should be alarmed. There will be a greater condemnation for them. Now, the phrase greater condemnation, that may take your mind to something written later in the New Testament. Specifically, in James chapter 3, it says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. It's a small point, 
of a much larger argument that is made by James, but it is a principle that we find and said in other ways in the text of the Bible, and that is that those who teach need to understand that they must be very careful in handling the doctrines of the faith. Why? Because like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law did, it is a terrible thing to close the door to someone believing in Christ. And there are many pastors and teachers who will find themselves at some point in the kingdom, but left out of the joy of the wedding feast. Verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Proselyte, it's Greek word proselytos, um, a convert. Um, in fact, uh, more often than not, it's used in, in the terms of a Gentile convert. They love to make converts, but, but they took great pride in making converts, especially making Gentiles into converts, and would go to great lengths and great expense to even do so. The problem is that by doing so, they were perpetuating their own error. In general, they were zealous for converts, but they brought all they converted under their own corrupt doctrine. They found many of their converts from people who were open to the idea of, be, of their being one God. Um, with the scattering of the Jewish people over the years, there was this overall exposure to Jewish thought in the Roman world. And there were those who were just exhausted from the burden of the many gods that they would have to show uh, uh, honor to. And they, they instead liked the idea of there just being one general God. And, and with the Jewish influence, they became aware of the Jewish moral law, and they liked that as well. And with the Jewish influence, they became aware of, of how they could convert over and be under less of a burden than they were under uh, what they found under Rome and, and Greece and so forth and so on. Um, but they, when they converted, they would generally do so along the lines of the ceremonial law, um, or they wouldn't go along with the ceremonial law, things that included such things as circumcision and so forth, um, but they would go along with the moral law. Um, so we see these people pictured in, in uh, places in the New Testament, like in, in uh, Acts 17 with uh, the, the devout Greeks in Thessaloniki. Um, or it says, and some of them were persuaded, a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. So, you know, that was a good mission field later on for Paul. But before the ministry of Paul, of course, before the ministry of Jesus, the Pharisees made it their aim to turn these people into their own uh, proselytes, their own converts. Now, the proselyte was the full convert that accepted the, the ceremonial law, um, more fanatical about the law than, than even the Jews who converted them. And, and Jesus continues this convert also then is more zealous for leading other people into uh, destruction. In other words, Jesus accused these Pharisees of being missionaries of evil and creating missionaries of greater evil. So I think we have time for for one more, more woe, that doesn't sound appealing, but let's read on verse 16. <laughs> I think we can fit one more woe in this morning. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that, that sanctifies the gold. And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. 
He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells on it, dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. So all the way back in chapter 5 of Matthew, Jesus spoke about oaths. In the Old Testament, God often guaranteed the fulfillment of his promises with an oath. And consider Genesis 9, where God makes a pledge to Noah and Noah's descendants and then promises to fulfill that pledge. In the same way, the Old Testament permitted a, a person to swear by the name of God to substantiate an important affirmation or a promise. An oath or vow work to help a person remain faithful to commitments and for the the person that made, the, the, the vow was made to, to trust that commitment would be kept. So the law demanded that a person uh, be true to any oath, such as a, a vow to the Lord that was part of the Old Testament sacrifice uh, or system of sacrificial offerings. Of course, one could and, and, and can make a commitment without an oath, but again, a strong oath inspired confidence that that, uh, that that commitment that was being spoken of would be kept. Jesus was involved in an oath in Matthew 26 when on, on trial before the high priest. Paul also expressed an oath in 1 Corinthians to express the, the depth of his concern for the Corinthians themselves. Other oaths are to be found in Galatians chapter 1, Philippians 1, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The, the Ravis developed a highly structured hierarchy of oaths, later comprising a, an entire section in the Mishnah um, that is a summary of the oral law. So oath-taking was, it was highly thought of by the religious leaders in that the truth was guaranteed by taking an oath. However, in Jesus' time, there were oaths being taken where no oath was necessary or even proper. For instance, it became very common to start a sentence with something like, I swear by my own head. Or um, today it might be something like, I swear on my mother's grave. And since the person didn't invoke the literal name of God, the oath wasn't considered to be binding, meaning the intent was to was to preserve some kind of loophole that could be accessed if needed. And this increasing tendency to find loopholes in an oath led then to the devaluation of oaths. An oath could be made that sounded legitimate, but if a person didn't want to keep that oath, they would say it was not a binding oath. Why? Because it was made without invoking the name of God. In matters of oaths, the Jewish legalists were experts in evasion. And Jesus here is creating a, he's using his words to create a character of how well they were able to evade an oath. And the character was this. It is possible to regard an oath by the temple as not being binding, but an oath made on the gold of the temple well that was binding an oath made by the uh, by the altar is not binding but an oath made by the gift on the altar is most certainly binding so you see Jesus has created he's created this this illustration that was kind of absurd um, in order to point out the, the fundamental deceitfulness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the elders. And, and, and it further points out their own unbelief. They were okay with breaking oaths because they didn't believe God. God hears every word we speak. And God sees every intent of our hearts. In view of that, this, this fine art of evasion that they had created was one that should have been foreign to them. And us today, it should also be foreign to us. 
Speaking of both the, the great white throne judgment of unbelievers and, and the, the judgment of works of believers, Jesus said in Matthew 12, I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Unbelievers will find themselves condemned with no possible argument they can make on their own behalf. Believers are vindicated, finding themselves rewarded then for their faithfulness to Christ. The religious leaders such as Pharisees, they would find themselves condemned by their own idle words. And as we've seen, their words were representative of their unbelief. I want to close this morning with some words. Words from 1 John, chapter 5. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which He has testified of His Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in Himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this morning. Again, for Your love and Your grace and Your mercy. For waking us up. For granting us breath. Causing our hearts to continue on beating. You're our Creator. You know us very, very, very well. We thank You, Lord. that You do have good plans for us. We thank You, Lord, that no matter what we see going on in this world today, that we can have confidence in what You have planned for us. We thank You, Lord, that even though we fail and we sin and though we stumble, that in You we are saved and we enter into eternal life. Lord, we ask that You would establish us in all of Your good things. Lord, our desire so often is to seek after our, ourselves, to desire only for ourselves and not to consider others, Lord. Father, help us to place others first in our lives, Lord. as You have loved us so much, as You love us so much, Lord, help us to love one another. We ask that You would guard our hearts, keep our hands from evil. Lord, protect us from the deceptions of our enemy, the devil. As we endure the many trials that we are bound to endure in this world, we thank You that You will see us through them. Not only that, but you grow us through them. Lord, we place ourselves before you. and We desire to do your will. We ask that you would lead us in victory. 
in each day, however you may, that you would use us to spread knowledge of Jesus Christ to all the unsaved world. May the Lord bless you. May He keep you. May He make His face and His light to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace, His shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's message from the Bible. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that the end result of sin is judgment and condemnation. But God graciously provides the means to you to be forgiven and to be saved. And that is by faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, taking the punishment that you deserve. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You receive the free gift of salvation in Christ by faith. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've done terrible things in my life, but I know that I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter what you have done, you can be too. For the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So please, don't put it off. Take this moment to confess Jesus. Thank you for listening. Remember to be a doer of the Bible and not just a hearer. That means demonstrating God's love to others as He has so abundantly poured out His love into your life. Most importantly, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It's the most important decision you could ever make. Choose your destiny. Don't let the world choose it for you. The Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and click on God to learn more about God's plan for your life. If you prayed to receive Jesus through this program, please let us know. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and select contact. While you're there, please consider sowing into this ministry by selecting donate. You have been listening to Grace Hope Love with Pastor Sean Bumpers and Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Thank you, my friend, for your fellowship, and may the Lord abundantly pour out His grace, hope, and love into your life.